Good morning. My name is Adrian Swenson. I'm the Development Director at Pacific Island Knowledge to Action Resources, headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah. We are hosting and co-sponsoring this, the ninth annual Pacific Islander Violence Prevention Conference. This breakout session is entitled, Voice for Change. It is a youth forum. Before we get started, please ensure your microphones are muted and remain so throughout the session. If you have questions, please write them in the chat, and time permitting, they will be answered at the end of the presentation. Aloha and welcome. My name is Hina Namau. I'm representing the Pacific Island Ladies Empowerment Group. I'm Missy Latui. Yeah. yeah. She is also co-leading the Pacific Island Ladies Empowerment Group. And I'm Arissa Tupol. I'm with the Pacific Island uh, Knowledge to Action Resource ELS program. So a little bit about our Pacific Island Ladies Empowerment Group. It is a support group that both me and Nessie made in order to create a safe environment for young women in high school just feel safe enough to come talk. How the group was made was me and Nessie were going through a situation at school where we were both being bullied and we didn't feel safe enough to go to anyone. So I had messaged my auntie Kamile Tripp asking her about where should I go or what resources do I have to go and create a group. And she sent me to Susie, our mentor and guide, to help us create this group. We meet every other Saturday at 4 p.m. at the Kearns Library, either in person or online on Zoom. We mainly wanted to focus talking about change. We wanted to bring an awareness to mental health and to let others know it's okay to not be okay. And if parents, if you're watching, feel free to ask questions, a lot of questions. We also wanted to be able to teach others how to find their voice. Being able to speak up about our passions and our truth. In the Polynesian culture, it's taboo to talk about mental health and sexual assault. We want people to know it's okay to talk about that, whether that's coming to a group like Kava Talks, Women's Empowerment, or Pacific Island Ladies Empowerment. We want people to feel safe enough to come seek for help and find guidance. We also want to empower youth to feel safe enough to use their voices. For example, when we ask why, like why what happened happened, feeling safe enough to ask why. For example, I notice a lot of teenagers and young kids, when we ask to do something, we oftentimes get told no. And with some parents, if we ask why, it's talking back. When Sometimes all the reality is we just want to understand why. Why can't we do it? And understand your perspective. Um, okay, my name is Loretta Tupola. I'm actually sitting in for Lulu Wolfgram, who is the executive direct, uh, director, or sorry, director of Empowered Living Services. Um, Lulu is over the youth program at Pixar and has been doing a lot of um, presentations out in our community about how to work best work with our youth. And I want to um, congratulate these um, young women for stepping up because we know that it's so hard for our youth to speak up and to speak out about these difficult topic, topics that Hina has shared with us today. Um, we have been, um, as PICTAR, trying to create safe spaces in our community so that um, on every level, for every gender, for our, our, our our kupuna, for our elders, for our young singles, our, our youth and as our, our females and women, and also our LGBTQ um, community, so that we can have these, um, these conversations. But I wanted to see if Hina and, and Nessie would share more about um, their experience being a part of this group. Um, I know it was, it was hard. Uh, we talk about bullying a lot and what that means and what that looks like. Um, but to have the courage to, to seek out a place where they can share their voice and feel safe um, 
took a lot. And so I'm really glad that they were able to approach Susie and begin this um, youth group. But can you tell us more about your experience and how it's helped you um, grow or, or go through these things that you guys are facing? In my own personal experience, this group has taught me it's okay to open up, especially about my story with the background with child abuse. It made a safe environment for me to find help and to talk about my story. I don't really know. It was just more of a safe space for me since I felt like I didn't really have it when I was at home. I want to um, thank you too for even having the courage to come up here and, and just even even share that. Um, I think for a lot of our, our viewers or who, people who are part of this um, conference, um, you, you can feel and sense the difficulty it, it, it is for our youth. And um, for many of our youth, we see a lot of their vibrance, of their you know very outgoing and, and, and all of that, but it, it, it's important to be aware um, if there are things that are going on behind all of that, behind the face of what they they show to people um, outwardly, but there's a lot of things that our youth are facing that we may not be aware of because they put on a face that everything is okay, or um, that they just continue to go about their days because they know that they can't go to to parents. Um, how can you guys share? Are, are, has it been easier for you to talk to your parents through this group and? Um, what was that like? Or to a trusted adult? It's made it a little easier coming to group and being able to talk to Jackie, Sincera, Nisi, and Susie. It's brought a lot of perspective and it was, it's a safer environment where as in at school or when I'm certain, when, or when I'm with certain cousins, I never felt like I was either too white to be brown or too brown to be white with how mixed my family is. Um, there's a lot of conversation that we've been having since the shooting in at Hunter High School. Um, through these safe spaces and through these youth groups, we've been able to reach out to our, our kids and just have these true conversations. And we didn't just go out there and say, hey, we want to know what you what you're going through and all of that. Uh, we really did go in um, with respect and humility to let our kids know that we're here for them and that their voice counted. So we went in and introduced ourselves and told our story. Um, Lou and I have been doing this with a lot of the schools in the Green, uh, Granite District, and um, <clears throat> and just Talanoa. We 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 use the the. The saying, um, Fofola Lefala, opened up the mat to the, to the youth and said, come sit down, come sit down and talk with us. Tell us what you want to, want to share. Tell us what you think you can't share with your parents. But we didn't just open the fala. We, we allowed them to really share and, and let them know that this was a safe space that we weren't going to, this was not for us to go back and tell their parents, you know, you're not doing a good job or your kids are struggling and they need help. It was just a place for them to um, unload a lot of the things that they're going through so that um, so that they could just relieve the stresses and press pressures that they're going they're they're experiencing especially in school and I wanted to share um, especially what Hina said a lot of what came up is um, being accepted for being accepted because they're either half you know they're apakasi something whether it's half Samoan, half Tongan, half white, half Tongan, or Samoan, um, a lot of our mixed children are having a hard time in school um, with identity because they feel like they don't belong. Like she said, either not poly enough or Pacific Island enough or, um, or Tupalani, um, and, and it's really sad. And so um, what we did for these youth groups is that we allowed them to speak and then we asked them, what is it that we can do or what is it that you would like to see um, changed so that you feel more comfortable in, in talking about these things that you're experiencing and every single group that we did they talked about identity 
about not knowing their own identity as Pacific Islanders, even though they grew up in a house that is strong um, in their culture, that practiced all their cultural practices. Um, they said they didn't know what it meant to be Tongan. They didn't know what it meant to be a Pacific Islander or Polynesian in America, being born and raised here and not and um, going to this into this Western system <laughs> and then going home and having to uh, being expected to know what it means to be Tongan, what it means to be Samoan. And um, they all shared this, every single one of the groups that we went to. And we said, okay, so what is it that we can help you with? What do you want to learn? And every single one of them said language, which was something that was very um, shocking to me because I feel like there's a lot of our kids that um, know their language more than, than in other cultures, but every single one of them said language. And they also wanted to know all the practices we do at home, what are the meanings behind them? We don't know. We just know that we do them, but we don't know why. And so uh, a lot of the conversations were about, um, about that. Um, can you guys share um, just some of those experiences or examples about um, those conversations? Like, talking about, <clears throat> even with your peers, how difficult it has been to talk about identity and um, belonging uh, to the Pacific Island co community? I think where a lot of my cultural identity crisis started was when I was a younger child, my grandfather, he was born and raised in Maui, Hawaii. He was a native Hawaiian, but he was born during the time where it was illegal to practice the culture or speak the language. So growing up, he made, he made sure to tell me and my sister to be proud to be American, but ashamed to be Hawaiian. One of his things that I can remember him telling me was he was proud at the fact I looked white. And at school, because I went to two different Polynesian charter schools, a lot of kids would look at me and be like, oh, are you really Polynesian? Are you really Hawaiian? Or are you just saying that to fit in? in which no matter what, and I'm, I've come to learn and accept this, no matter where I go and no matter where I am, I'm never really gonna fit in. I'm always gonna be proud of the fact that two of my grandparents are from England. One of them are, is from Puerto Rico and one's from Hawaii. I'm gonna be proud of the fact that I'm culturally rich enough to be mixed. Can you share with us a little bit about your experience? Um, I'm full Tongan, but the I don't know Tongan, so when I see other kids, I feel like I'm not really that much of a Tongan because they'd be telling me that. I don't know. Yeah, there, there's um, that, a lot of what was shared by the youth was that, um, sorry. A lot of the bullying and the teasing and um, the uncomfortableness that they felt was by other Pacific Island youth. It's not even by our uh, other nationalities or cultures. It's happening within our own families and within our own community. And that was a sad thing for me um, to have a discussion about um, because we, we asked them who's experiencing bullying um, or abuse or any kind of violence. And they shared and we said, you know, what are the reasons? And they had shared some of these things that they're sharing today. <laughs> But so that it was other Pacific Island youth and family members that they were being teased by or felt unaccepted by or felt like they didn't belong, um, even though they were amongst, you know, what we share all the time is the most important part of our culture, which is family. And so uh, Lulu, and, Lulu and I went back and we knew that we had to come back with a different kind of conversation that we had to teach 
our kids and instill and build pride in them so that they could be one proud of who they are, but also to be proud of where they come from. And we knew that these conversations couldn't just happen here, that we had to now go back into the community and talk with the parents and, and, and our grandparents even, and get, find a way to connect them to the youth so that they know that um, where they come from is a strong place, that they come from a foundation and a strong lineage <laughs> and heritage of, of, of Pasapica. And um, we did go back into the community. We did a trauma-informed care um, um, training with parents and with community members. And it was interesting because the, the disconnect of where the adults were in this conversation was so huge. You know, no one knowing that their children felt this way. No one knowing that you know, what they were doing was not resonating with, with our youth. And so when we talked about the disconnect, we talked about the different learning styles and the different generations of, of teaching and, and where our parents are. Um, and we didn't realize this, but as we were having these conversations, we realized that the youth and the, and the parents were not aware of these conversations because we're not having them, right? So when we talked to the parents, um, we had to go back to the youth and say, you know, we have to give our, our parents some leeway because they were also taught by parents who didn't have these conversations. So a lot of them um, were taught by, I do, you observe, then you learn what I do, and then you do it. No verbal communication about, you know, like we do in Western style where we sit down and say, this is how you do this, we explain it, we show them, and then we, you know, follow through with the conversation not the way that we learn uh, Polynesian style or Pacific Island style. It is you observe the, act, the, the activities and the actions that I do, and then you, you learn it that way, and then you practice it. Um, and so when we talked to the youth, they said, yeah, we don't know what that's meant. What is Falavalave? Why do we take the quilts to these families? Why do we take money over there? Um, and, and, and the perspective of the culture has been about money or about showing off or about, and parents not realizing that's what they're getting out of this. That's what they get out of when we go to these funerals. I was trying to teach them service. I was trying to teach them that when people are in trouble, we go to help. And when we're in trouble, they come and help us. It's that, uh, that was the disconnect that we saw in the, the, the two conversations. And so, um, I, sorry, I really want you guys to share more about this. Uh, this experience, but I, I just feel like I have to explain for a lot of the community because we're having these separate conversations, the learning that has come out of having these conversations with parents versus having them with the youth. And the youth have so many questions, so many things that they want to share, but they don't know how to share and communicate in a culture where you don't talk back, you don't say anything. I tell you, and then you just do. And um, and, um, and also, again, trying to explain to them that it's not, there's a appropriate way. So when Tauhiba was sharing about appropriate ways and appropriate tools to have these conversations, we also have to teach that. Uh, we had a kid um, that we talked to and we did this presentation and then the kid went home and said, it's my right, I don't, you can't talk to me like that. You can't eat me, I'm gonna call the CPS. And uh, that was not our intention. It was just to, you know, we were just talking about um, being able to, to, to speak. And, uh, and um, so now the conversation is different. We're having with the kids that there is a way to have these conversations in a respectful way. It's not to go and now tell parents what you learned, your rights are in, in this American culture, but there's a way to sit down and have these conversations. But on the, at the same time, saying to parents, when your children are ready to have this conversation, I don't care what you're doing. You need to drop the dishes or drop the driving around and have the conversation when they are ready. Because if you wait and say, wait till we get home and then let's talk, they may not open up or come back to you. Um, um, Nessie and Hina, can you guys speak more on that about being open and having and trying to have conversations but not feeling like it's the right time or it's not appropriate and how group has helped you or having being a part of Pixar has helped you um, have these be more comfortable having these conversations. 
I would say with my background with child abuse, Hector has definitely like helped me learn. There was a fine line between where times where I was being hit, it was discipline, and the other times where it wasn't. It helped me be, like, accept the fact that it happened. Do you feel like it's never the right time? It's something I'm still learning. I think the hardest part of learning how to speak out and talk to people was a lot of my friend groups, it was always a mix of Hispanics and Polynesians. And in both cultures, abuse isn't a thing. So it was really hard finding someone to just sit down and open up to that didn't tell me, oh, it was your fault. That's a question. Can you tell me who you are without being the one understanding? No. What is your friend's name next to you? This is Nancy. You tell me who you are and you're not coming. Because most of the time you don't feel like you're coming, right? Yeah. So if you don't feel like you're coming, then really you feel like you are in your being you. That's the person I'm looking for. I just want to see who you are. I appreciate you asking those questions, Oscar, because um, that's a lot of the work that we've been doing is just trying to get that out of them. Who are you without these labels? Who are you without, you know, saying that, oh, I'm Tongan. When, when we did introductions, that was the first thing all of the kids said. My name is this, and I'm Tongan, or I'm full-blooded Samoan. And um, there was such a strong pride about them sharing that, yet in the discussions sharing, I don't know what that means. I just know that's who I am because that's who I look like, that's where I come from. And um, so we geared a lot of the activities, we follow up activities that we do with them around building that, um, that their identity, not just around the culture, but just around who they are as people. And um, we did a, we didn't do it with the group, but with our, one of our high schools, we did a presentation on Tatao and how every, all of the markings have a meaning behind them. And we gave them an opportunity to draw a Tatao or a, a design that represented who they were. And it was just amazing, the, the pictures that they shared, they brought out a lot, everything that done, didn't have to do anything with their ethnicity. It was about sports, about you know their love for art, their love for music, and um, and and they really loved the activity because they they found an identity outside of their ethnic culture. And um, I don't know what you, do you guys have anything else to share about that? But just being okay with who you are. I think going back to how you're talking about the Tao Tao, a lot of my tattoos, I was grateful to be incorporated because I've always believed that you can't get something done to you if it doesn't have a meaning. And I'm thankful that my artist was able to incorporate my stories and being able to learn more about the tribal behind it before getting it tattooed on me. So I've been working with young women for the past uh, 25 years, just like you. Can you guys look at me? I'm just looking at you as a human, not as a Tongan, okay? A lot of times, um, young women struggle because they don't ever get to say what they really want to say. And so I wanted to tell you how proud I am for you guys sharing, because it's not easy, right? You're sitting here and you're, you're in tears because you're, 
your heart is full and you have so much to say and you don't know how to say it. You don't know how it's gonna be judged. You don't know how people are gonna look at you. You wonder if, uh, if you're doing the right thing because it's scary as heck. But can I tell you too, there's young women just like you right outside these doors that are wishing that they can have the courage to say what you're saying. So with that, I just want you to say, to understand something, yes, your culture is Tongan, but who you are is who you decide to be. I, I'm a big brown guy, okay? I'm Tongan, but I'm who I am, and who I am is Oscar. And wherever I go, I can only be who I am. And who I am is somebody that's loving, is somebody that's kind to people. I go around, people know me as the guy that hugs everybody. And I, and I just do that because that's who I am. And you can like it or don't like it, but that's who I am. And so I want you two to know who you are is dying to come out. I see it in this young lady right here. What is her name? Nessie. Nessie. I see it in you. It's dying to come out. Please don't be afraid to let it out. What is your name? And Kina, just be who you are. It's because she's trying to say, look at me, I, I'm mixture. I've got a lot in me and I hope that you get to see who I am someday, right? Rather than thinking I have to be a certain person. So bless you guys and thank you for sharing. Okay, I wish I could spend time with you. You know, listening especially to you, Kina, I, I relate to a lot of what you're saying because, um, you know, my, my family, my dad is Tongan and my mom is, my mom's family is Swedish. And so I had a lot of those same <clears throat> feelings of too white to be brown, too brown to be white, right? Um, and one of the things that it took me a really long time to learn, but I feel like I've I'm still learning is that, um, you know, when I would think, when people would try to tell me that what I'm doing is not Tongan enough, you know, um, I realized that whatever I'm doing is Tongan because I am. And so if I'm a Tongan and I'm doing it, then it's Tongan enough. You know, and so I think like we need to think about, um, you know, that was just a, a change for me that I thought, you know, I don't, I don't have to be the same kind of Tongan as somebody else because what I'm doing is enough. Um, and I just wanted to, for both of you, this is incredibly brave, and I don't think that I would have um, been able to do it at your age. And so I really am, as a, um, a Pacific Islander woman, I'm really proud of you guys. And um, I just want to say that it gets better. You know, like I'm, I'm in a place now where we, I don't feel that anymore. Um, and I think part of it is age and part of it is just finding the right people. And you guys have found some really cool people already. So you guys are already light years ahead of where I was. But um, it gets a lot better. And it's high school is such a hard time anyway. Um, but I'm really I just wanted to come up and tell you guys how proud I am that you guys are doing this and how much of a difference you're gonna make for other people by um, sitting up here and being an example for them. So good job. I actually saw a <laughs> question come up on the screen asking, besides talking, what else do we do at group? 
a lot of the activities that we've done so far up to this point has like it's involved a lot of art like recent our last group meeting we were painting canvases i don't really think we had an idea in mind of what we were painting about and the meeting before that we did we painted rocks and valentine streets the Valentine streets were to find a way to have self love and the rocks for mine I put my a quote that helps me. Because i've learned a lot of growing up and a lot of like finding the right people to be around was you need to trust the energy around you and trust your vibes. Because you can always when not when you're not paying attention to the energy around you, you can never really tell if someone's using you just talking to you to take that information turn it around and bully you and a lot of it is like finding the right people to talk about like your struggles your mental health whether that be dealing with depression anxiety ptsd any type of mental illness and feeling safe enough to talk about it There's, um, can I ask you guys if there's um, one thing that you hope to change and that you've been learning out of group and um, being around, um, you know, our Pixar family and, and, and surrounding yourself with more positive people, um, what would that be? If anything, I hope it's something I can take into my future because a lot of my my personal goal in life and what I'm going to college for is to be a teacher. So I'm hoping I can set a better example and create a safe place in a classroom and offer a lot more opportunities than what I had. About you, Nessie. What's something that you th you would like to see change or would like to help change with all of you've learned through group? For me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Hopefully opening up more. Opening up more? And then, and then before we go to the questions, what is something that you'd like you guys you both would like to leave our audience and those who are here with us today um, a message you want to leave with them um, that they re can remember from this sharing and experience. I think what I want to leave is it's okay to never be okay and for my my like every kid that's close to their parents, I want them to be able to feel safe enough to be like, look, mom or dad, this is what's going on. And I would really just like you to sit down and listen. Um, I was gonna say the same thing about it's okay to not be okay. Do we have any other questions in the chat? or in the room. <laughs> Are there any questions in the room? Anybody online, any questions in the chat you have for these young ladies or Loretta? Okay, we want to thank Hina and Nessie and Oretta for coming. Uh, girls, we appreciate your courage and your willing and ability to share with us. It has been impactful and meaningful. This will conclude. The
sorry, before we before we end our session, I just wanted to give a chance for everybody to ask if they needed to. But um, if you want to learn more about our PICTAR programs, please let us know. Um, we, we really have taken a holistic approach to our services to make sure that we not only provide group for us to just talk about what's going on, we're providing programs through healing in a cultural way through our Pacific Island um, enriching arts program where they, they can do a lot of art like Hina shared. We have other, we have cover talks where our men can also share, uh, women's empowerment where, where our women are able to share. And we have a lot of groups in different areas across the state. We're also, we also have a youth program that we are, um, are building up where they have activities. They have rugby clinics we are a part of. We're partnering with many of our Pacific Island families and organizations who are here in Utah servicing our community. We also are in the high schools talking with kids about culture, about identity, and about violence, and talking about it in a healthy way. We are also doing community because we understand that this has to be a conversation we all have together. And um, in order to be comfortable having these conversations, well, some of us need tools. I, I wasn't, um, when I grew up, I was strong in my culture. I, I knew who I was. I grew up by, from a single mother. And I just thought that every Polynesian that, that I knew was proud and knew who they were because that's the way that I was raised. But to, to hear a lot of the stories of our youth and, and even women who are my age say that they feel so dis disconnected from the world even and who they are it really saddens me that we can't have these conversations or that our children are struggling to have these conversations because they feel like they can't come to us as adults. So I just want to encourage all of our Pacific Island families, please be open to having talk story, Talanoa with your kids, with your family members. I know that many of us have experienced tra traumatic experiences in our lives, but in order to break the cycle, we have to have a conversation. We have to be able to be comfortable having these conversations. So like Vienna shared, start with you, start with healing yourself, join us in our groups. Um, a lot of people have said to me, I don't need group, I don't need therapy. You know, I don't want to go there. It's for people who have problems. But on the side, I get calls every day, emails, texts every day from normal people who say, that's not for me, saying I need help, but I'm too ashamed. I don't want to shame my family name. But I just want you to know that you're not alone, and it's not something that you should be ashamed about. So talk to your kids. Get them involved in activities outside of the norm because we are not just about sports. We are not just about arts or singing or dancing. There is so much more to each and every one of us that we have to share and offer this world, and this world needs it. They could use a lot of our Pacific Island culture and love. We have so much to offer, and I just want to encourage everyone to find out more about the programs at PICTAR. Um, talk to, if you are youth watching this, please talk to Hina, talk to Nessie, talk to the other youth that are involved in our programs and get more engaged. It's the only way that we're going to change the future is if we change it now. And the work that we are doing as PICTAR is not for us, it's for the future generation. They're the ones that are going to experience things if we don't make the changes now. Um, and I want to also thank you because I wasn't even supposed to be on this panel. So thank you, Hina and Nessie. I, I agree with everyone. I'm so glad um, that you guys agreed to come and have this conversation because I know now that youth are going to come out and have them have more courage because they've seen you take the courage even to just sit up here and do this in front of people. I want you to both to know that I love you very much and uh, I'm just grateful for you sharing your stories. And thank you to all of you who joined us and um, are supporting these young women. And also thank you to PICTAR for um, this opportunity. All right, we do have one question, if that's okay. Thank you. The, your presentation is very powerful. And the question I was going to ask actually has been answered by just what you said. But I'll ask anyway, because I would like to get your perspective on that. 
is that all this um, hard wrenching discussion is a way to open our mind. But I wonder also, as a young person, what is your vision about the concrete steps, the concrete things that we should do and what it will be like? I mean, it's not just the community that who has responsibility in addressing this, um, the school as well to help to identify and help what to prevent bullying. So I just wonder from both of your perspective, what do you think are some of the concrete things that not just the community, the PI community can do, but also the general community like school? I think one of the concrete things besides bringing love to the culture and having a community to fall back on is being able just to go to your own family, your own household and say, look, I'm not okay. This is what's going on. And just being able to open up in our own homes. But that also has to start with children and the parents. And the, not to speak for the parents, but I guess a parent's perspective of, look, my kid isn't talking back. My kid just wants to tell me that he or she may be feeling depressed. And the parents understanding that this is our your role as parents of guiding and protecting us and the kids of learning a respectful way to go to your parent instead of just going up and be like, you know, you're a bad parent for not helping me, for not being here. No, it's really just sitting down and being able of, I know this isn't the way we were raised. Because in my own family, my, my dad and his siblings, my grandma raised them of, oh, you have a good education. If you're strong in the church, you're okay. There should be nothing wrong. But that's never the, the case, there's always more to that. So I think just being able to go and be like, I'm not okay. And same thing for parents, being able to rely on your kids, especially if you're a single parent and not knowing who to go to, just like being able just to talk to your kids, it really starts in the family. Um, I just want to say, Ming, you're right. It's not just our responsibility or our families or our communities. Um, on a macro level, we are talking to a lot of our school districts who feel like the, the incidents that happen in our schools are <coughs> cultural issues, not district issues. And that's not right. These are issues that um, are happening for a lot more communities than just our own. And one of the things that we've been asking them is to invite our community to the table. When you're discussing about how to address these issues on our community, we need to be there at the table. There are things that the district doesn't understand about culture, about um, families, about um, just values and beliefs that impact the attitudes or the things that the kids are going through at school. And so um, because these families are dealing with multiple issues at home, to come to school and then um, for some of them is the only safe space they have. It's the only place that some of them get a meal. It's the only place. And so education might not be the only, uh, by, be their priority, even though they're at school, but our administrators, our teachers need to understand that. And the best way is to provide more cultural humility training for them and training that will help them to understand the different values of our communities and, and the things that they're facing. Um, these conversations are being held with our Granite District and we're, we're slowly moving. Um, uh, we've, we've had conversations with the governor and the Multicultural Advisory Committee um, because we know that we have to educate. We have to do a lot of education. But for us, these conferences and the things that we've been doing on, our, on the community level have been to get our community um, to engage more in the system because they're not going to know how to help us if we don't tell them what's going on. And so we're starting here with our youth um, and then our families and, and hopefully can get our, our systems to understand um, these same things as well. More receptive than they had in the past, past couple of years. Um, you know, our, our, our systems, our nation goes through these trends of things that come up and a lot of it has to do with funding. And um, the more people that we, that's why we're trying to push education, whether it's a four year or a trade school, something to empower our people to find confidence and find their voice so that they can share what's going on. 
and um, the more people that we get to these tables where they're making decisions about our community, it's being more accepted than, than before. And I know that with the school district, and especially here in Utah, as we are working with the governor on a lot of things, they want to know. They're asking now, who do I need to bring to the table so we can have this conversation? It's not going to change overnight, but because equity, inclusion, and diversity is something that's huge going on because of the pandemic, um, people are more receptive and wanting to learn more how they can or what they need to change on a policy level so that we can um, experience more equity on the ground. One more question here in the room in Salt Lake City. I, I don't have a question. Hi, Hina. <laughs> Hi, Nessie. I just wanted to share some thoughts um, since I've been able to participate with the girls in some of the groups with Susie, Jackie, and uh, Lulu. Uh, you did it. <laughs> I'm so proud of you girls. Um, I've been really fortunate and honored to share space with you two. I'm just speaking directly to you two. You have taught me a lot about how to speak. I have a high school age daughter and our relationship has been built stronger because of that. And she's finding her voice to come and join you two at group as well. You have, Nessie comes to group with her little brother. Uh, I think he's seven, is that right, Nessie? And she's an amazing big sister to him. They come, we have a conversation, we eat <laughs> and just talk about our day, whatever it is that's on these girls' minds. Uh, Hina, she's very, very strong, um, just like Nessie. Hina knows herself very well. She's, um, if I were that independent at, my, at your young age, you know, I wasn't that strong like you were, but I can be strong in this space with you and learn from you both. So. I wanna say thank you and that I appreciate you both and for sharing your vulnerability and your bravery here today and every Saturday, every other Saturday when we have group, um, you're doing something impactful and amazing for all of us here and you're our next generation. So be proud of yourselves, even if you're just sitting in the seat today, looking as beautiful as you both are. Um, thank you so much and just want to send you both my love and you can come to group next Saturday. It will be facilitated by Jackie at Kearns Library for those who are in Utah. Please join us. It's a really good time and it's at 4 p.m. I love you, Hina and Nessie. Thank you. Again, we would like to thank Hina and Nessie and Oretta for being here, for sharing your experiences, for your courage and your bravery. This will end this session. <coughs> We're going to take a 10 minute break. Our next session will be the state of domestic violence in Samoa and American Samoa, a comparison of two societies sharing a single culture.